Hello, I'm Alan Cole, founder of Eureka Report, finance presenter on ABC News and a columnist for The New Daily. And I'm Stephen Main, contributor and intelligent investor, founder of Crikey, shareholder, advocate and City of Manningham councillor. And we are... The, the Money, money cafe, cafe in a different cafe. Back in because the Leclerc, short straw. Because the Cleck is closed. Temporarily. Temporarily, but yes. there you go. That was a so surprise. We showed up, at the, showed up at the door this morning and... Lockout. It was lockout. a lockout. It was a lockout. So uh, we've gone around the corner. Thank you to the short straw for accommodating us at, with no notice. So have you had much to do with Kevin Rudd over the years? Oh, look, I, I remember... First time I came across him was in a bar late at night in Hobart after the 1993 COAG meeting, and he was the head of the top bureaucrat in Queensland, and he was having a late night cocktail with the top bureaucrat from New South Wales, and he was criticising our energy reform in Victoria, and I was with the Adelaide Advertiser's chief political reporter, John Ferguson, who's just won the Gold Quill Award. I introduced him and said, Kevin, you know, I'm from Victoria, I work for Jeff Kennett, this is... Uh, John Ferguson, he works for the Adelaide Advertiser, and he looked up and he said, "The Adelaide, uh, he said, South Australia is one giant community service obligation for the rest of Australia." <laughs> and I thought, "Wow, that's a pretty polite way to say hello, John. Nice to meet you." And then later on, when I made that public, when he was trying to secure votes in South Australia, he denied any memory of it and said it was a rumour and couldn't possibly be true and. Yeah, so he's a bit of a confrontational hothead, I would say. Well, possibly going to deny having said anything about Donald Trump now, you would think. Well, it's harder when they're live tweets, but... Uh, Correct, yeah, that's yes. right. But, so, I mean, what, what a Murdoch News Corp stitch up this whole exercise was to get, you know, Sky News Australia asks Mr Farage to ask Trump this question and then does the stitch up on Rudd. Rudd didn't, didn't even know who he was. Trump didn't know who he was. Yeah, so, yeah, Trump didn't know who he was. He's just sitting there going, oh, you know, oh, he's nasty. But he's, uh, but he's, but he's apparently nasty and, uh, you know, not, yeah. not the brightest bulb. So, I do agree with Albo's response yesterday in Parliament of really getting into Dutton for politicising our ambassador sort of positions and uh, just just should have gone through to the keeper. Who yeah. cares what – and, and if, if Rudd becomes president, deal with it at the time. But, uh, you keep transposing Rudd and Trump. You yeah. mean if Trump deal becomes president? Yes, yes. Sorry about that, but uh, no, no. But that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, as Graham Richardson yesterday, they're both difficult people. So both difficult people. Both yeah, difficult right. people. Possibly Trump is more difficult. I than would Kevin, say but just a fair bit more. Yes, mm. yes. So, uh, hey, uh, uh, why did the Tabcorp CEO get sacked? Do you do you know? Yes. R- the real reason. Yes, well, it has been reported is that he made a, 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 a lewd remark about the CEO of the Victorian Gambling Regulator. So, um, who is a uh, female? Annette Kimmett, yeah. And Annette did first come to fame when she was the CEO of Minter Ellison, who did an all staff email objecting to the fact that Peter Bartlett was acting for Christian Porter. And she said that she was troubled by this and this had breached protocols. And so she, she was basically challenging the old presumption of everyone's entitled to have a lawyer. And so she got moved on because she was very upset that their firm, Inter Ellison, had agreed to act for Christian She got Porter. moved on. She didn't move on yeah, she on got, her own accord. She got moved on. And so she'd previously been a big four accounting firm. And then so she pops up as a gambling regulator. But she's very strong, obviously, on gender. So she had a, a history in, in the gender space. So to then have a blokey CEO of Tabcor uh, making a lewd remark about some sort of favour he might do to her if she made some sort of regulatory decision, uh, then got leaked by a whistleblower within his own organisation. Well, presumably it was cor- corroborated, was it? Correct, yeah. yeah. So someone wanted to get rid of him, dobbed him in, and he's said that he couldn't recall making the statement. <laughs> thought, what, was he drunk? I mean, you don't forget saying something like that, I would have thought. But uh, I, I should say, everybody, that um, we aren't going to we aren't going to repeat what he said because um, we'd have to get sacked as well. Well, that's right. We weren't in the room. But, uh, I mean, it does, it does sort of remind you of other CEOs who've been sacked over sort of Comments. So obviously you had such as well Grant Kelly. You've always got a list of these things, yes. Stephen. Grant Kelly at vicinity <laughs> centres. 
Um, what did he do? He talked about uh, Marie Fester, who was the head of communications. He talked about how they're, quote, we're both attractive people and we have had to deal with that our whole lives. So sort of making sort of innuendos about how they are attracted to each other, he claimed. So he was he was uh, seen off, and then Ian Smith. So Ms. Fester didn't agree that he was an attractive. Person. Well, she she <laughs> went to the board, and there was a review, and then she stood up publicly and let it be known what happened. And good on Marie for doing that. She's now the CEO of Chief Executive Women, and uh, and a very good operator <laughs> as well. And you had Ian Smith at Orica back in 2015. He was a tough nut mining guy from Broken Hill, and he just swore and, and cursed at too many female executives in the investor relations and the corporate communications space. So he got marched out for swearing. Then, of course, you had um, David Jones, Mark McGuinness. Um, oh, yeah, Mark The McGinnis. old sort of um, affairs with staff sort of Who was warmly scenario. embraced by Solly Lou. Solly Lou, that's right. And, of course, Jeff Bainbridge, our favourite, the lark distilling guy who was oh, yes. caught on video... Uh, uh, smoking something inappropriate and uh, talking about uh, things that might happen with this uh, other party on the video who then chose to uh, make it public. Should have been drinking whiskey, not smoking Correct. weed. Correct. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, but uh, look, you know, the lesson is, lads, and they're all lads, is Keep yourself nice. Keep yourself nice. Keep yourself sober. Don't <laughs> swear at anyone. Don't raise your voice. Don't make any propositions and you'll go all right. There you go. Now, I'm going to ask you about China. So you've written a column this week saying that TikTok should be banned, which I think is an outrageous thing to say. And I was going to ask you, what does your mate Paul Keating think about such a proposition, given that he's being a renegade, having a meeting with the Chinese foreign minister today, I think it is, undermining Penny Wong? He would be furious at you writing a column saying that TikTok should be banned. Well... He rang me yesterday and we had a long talk, but he <laughs> didn't mention it. So I'd say he's not furious and uh, possibly he didn't read it, I guess. But anyway, um, but we were talking about other things. But uh, look, uh, uh, my proposition that TikTok should be banned is not because it's owned by a Chinese company. It's because, as I understand it, now I'm not an expert on these things, which possibly showed quite clearly in the column, <laughs> um, uh, that uh, it's tracking Pixel which uh, picks up data from its users and anyone who, watch, in fact, watches a TikTok video is much more invasive than any other social media's um, tracking uh, cookie or pixel. And also its algorithm is much more um, uh, influential. It sort of it, uh, is more distorting of the... Of the Videos, in, as I understand it. Okay, and so you made a I, I comment mean, I, that it was it was distributing a lot of pro Hamas well, anti-Israel material. Listen, I, at the I have not looked at TikTok, and I've, uh, I mean I've, I've had to rely on what others have told me about it. Mm. So, which is possibly a, a flaw. I mean, I should arguably look at TikTok to do it. But I made a few phone calls. Uh, people I believe and trust told me this stuff, so I kind of mm. wrote it. Mm. Um, so that's the thing. I mean, I, and I specifically said in the column that it is not because it shouldn't be because it's Chinese. It doesn't matter. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we we banned Huawei because it's Chinese. Yeah, we always um, seem to ban the most successful Chinese companies, or at least the Amer you know the Americans well, do. So, uh, well, apparently it's because of advice from ASIO. Yeah, and on advice from ASIO, the government has banned TikTok from government phones. Yeah, yeah. So, and in India has banned. TikTok as well, but I think that is because it's Chinese and they were having a bit of a yeah, yeah. bit of a difficulty with China at the time. Yeah, I think the better solution is just to mandate a public float of TikTok, um, not you know in the Chinese market. No, no, the, the problem is not the ownership of TikTok. The problem is what it does. Yeah, but the so, but if the ownership the of business model is based on it's a, you know a very uh, invasive tracking. Yeah. Pixel, as I understand yeah. it, yeah. so the business model of the thing needs to change, and yeah. it shouldn't be it shouldn't be floated or sold at a high price that's based on uh, that 
um, you know, that activity. That yeah, it's but I, I would engaging. argue that, that, that it needs a regulatory solution about, you know, what you can embed in your, tixel, in your pixels. And, and But the, the primary fee, I mean, I agree with you, it's massively influential. And I agree with you that the young, the young people, you know, anti-Israel, pro-Palestine position is, has been profoundly influenced globally by TikTok. And you made a similar point about the anti, the no case on The Voice was strongly amplified on TikTok. So it's got enormous power, and I do agree that it would be worrying if the Chinese government was able to deploy that and direct it. So what needs to be fixed is removing the Chinese government's ability to, to deploy it, and that happens by getting all the servers out of China, getting it listed in the US, having a fully independent board that would never, ever give anything to the Chinese government. That That's what needs to be fixed, not no, but, a but total no, ban. No, but I don't... I'm not... Yeah, I keep saying I, it isn't because it's Chinese. As I, I was, it was put to me that the uh, TikTok is like having a listening device in your home without your permission, mm. picking up everything you say mm. and recording it, and also a tracking device in your car without your permission. That's, I mean, that's. But it is. We that, have so given permission because problem. we've all signed off in the fine print of the terms and con- terms and conditions. Um, yeah, but nobody reads them. That's, yeah, yeah I, I mean that's bullshit. That needs to be. That needs to be. I mean, yeah. see, I think that basically, I think that. Governments everywhere have not have been too slow in f- catching up with what's going on on social media in oh, general, right? I agree. Big tech, I agree. Just, Google, uh, Apple, all, all of them are way out of control, they're way just too dumping, powerful. They're dumping cookies and they're using algorithms that governments have no idea about. And um, you know, if it was kind of in an analog world, they wouldn't have any. They wouldn't have a bar of it. Yeah, but it's because it's digital. They don't understand it or they something. They, I agree. They leave it go. Now, I want to briefly, before we get up, we need to cover off on the Reserve Bank and interest rates, but I just want to briefly mention that the Australians' new rich list is out, and they've got Gina Reinhardt at $50.5 billion, and then you've got four kids at $3.92 billion each. So the total Reinhardt family is now at $66.16 billion. You've got Nicola and Andrew Forrest at $37 billion. You've got Clive Palmer at $21 billion, And he's primarily an iron ore WA wealth guy as well. You've then got the, uh, the, the Wright family. So that's Angela Bennett. They were the you know, original partners of Lang Hancock. They're at $7.8 billion. And you've got Stan Perrin's family, uh, he, the late Stan Perrin. He had 15% of the Wright Hancock royalties. He's at 4 Chris Ellison at 1.78. So you've got six families, six families worth a combined $138 billion in net wealth. Meanwhile, the West Australian government still has $49.8 billion of outstanding borrowings and a borrowing program this year of $5.8 billion, which is $5.3 billion in rollover and $500 million in new debt. And the iron ore royalty is only 7.5%. So how can six families be worth $138 billion from a state that still has a $49.8 billion debt and is undercooking its royalty at only 7.5% when in Queensland they've increased the top coal royalty to 40%? Do you think that somehow we're not getting a fair price for our state-owned iron ore assets? I think those, those six families are... I w- would entirely disagree with you, Stephen. But surely, how much is enough? I just want to point out that my new grandson, Leonard, has just entered the room. Oh, fantastic. Wow. <laughs> oh, my goodness me. We've got, we've got family visits. <laughs> this is very exciting. Leonard, uh, Leonard is about a month old. Oh, wow. And two Leonard, months. And two Leonard's months. not at all concerned about the iron ore royalty rate in WA. Oh, I'm sure he will be. <laughs> Eventually. Um, okay, so we move on to questions, or do you want to talk about the well, interest I mean, rates? Was, are the you RBA? happy with the Reserve Bank's decision, obviously, to pause at four point three five percent? I thought. Did you think Michelle Bullock performed well in her second? I thought she was. Press she looked really relaxed. It was a good, a good effort. Um, you know, and I've, they've <laughs> they've shifted to a neutral bias from a tightening bias, um, which everyone got very excited about. And the market and all economists are saying that their first rate cut will be in September, which in, which I think is too late. Mm. But there you go. And um, there's also a bit of a skirmish going on with the what happens with the Reserve Bank boards. So they're supposed to be having a new interest rate setting board by July 1, 
but uh, there's been a few sort of Ian McFarlane and other old guarders are criticising this and you've got the opposition threatening to withdraw their support over tenure of existing directors, you know, whether the, whether the board should be spilled or whether existing directors should be guaranteed a job on one of the two new boards. Is this all just sort of hot air and we should just get on with the reform? Well, look, it depends on whether you whether you take much notice of the, the RBA review that was headed by uh, three expert people, one of whom was the Deputy Governor of the uh, Bank of Canada and um, uh, a couple of uh, senior public servants in Australia, and they uh, they recommended that the that this structure change because uh, they clearly spelt out that the current board has been um, uh, has been snowed. Snowed. Yep. Uh, yeah, they were pretty clear and pretty ferocious about that. So, you know, they said, well, we need to have a, a bunch of experts determining monetary policy and the, the board should run the business of the RBA like a company board. And that was the that was uh, their recommendation and the government accepted it, right? So, yeah, sure, Ian McFarlane and a few others have said, harumph, harumph. <laughs> um, uh, fair enough. Uh, I do think that um, it would be wise of um, uh, Jim Chalmers to... Consult Angus Taylor and the opposition, and make it try to make it a bipartisan set of appointments, but they tend not to do that. I mean, I, you know, I think, yeah, I do think we've we've strayed too far from bipartisanship in general in Australia, and I think it'd be a good idea to try to make these appointments bipartisan. Yeah, and I think that the key negotiation that Taylor seems to want is not spilling the board and guaranteeing that the existing directors can serve out their terms. Sure, they can, and well, I they agree can continue with that. To, well they can no continue to sacked. run the business. Yeah, no, well, no, well, let but, them run the business and bring in a bunch of experts to run monetary policy. But I That's slot, the I would slot idea. Ian Harper across onto the new specialist interest rate yeah, setting sure. board. So yeah, basically got to carve up. Everyone gets a gig, you know, maybe one or two go across to the new board and the rest stay on the old board. Yeah. But no one gets sacked, I think would be a a reasonable uh, compromise to the the Taylor Dutton complaints, yeah, well, um, and it is interesting on this bipartisan thing. Albo has clearly had enough of Feral Greens on the left and Dutton opposing everything on the right, and he's now saying on the religious discrimination reforms, even on aged care donations reform, if it's not bipartisan, I'm not going to do it. And after the Voice last year, where the the Libs just wrecked it, I actually reckon it's quite a clever tactic because. It is hardball getting anything contested through the Senate. So he says, I'm not going to let you, you know, like the way the Greens strung them along on the new housing fund and all that sort of stuff. It's just like, look, I'm not even going to try unless you actually agree at the start we're going to get this done. And that puts it on over to, to, to Dutton and co, all the Greens, to actually say, well, we're really keen for this reform. Let's sit down and get a deal done before it comes to Parliament and then just get it through without a ridiculous nine-month process. Fair enough. Before we move to questions, let's have a quick word from our sponsor. Is it time to brush up on your investing skills and knowledge? Well, Invest Smart's Investor Bootcamp is for you. Learn the fundamentals of investing, how to form better money habits, and what it takes to build long-term wealth. Do it at your own pace over three months with the option to participate in live weekly webinars to consolidate your learning. Usually $99, Money Cafe listeners can get $40 off with the code MONEY40. Visit investsmart.com.au forward slash bootcamp and use MONEY40 to save $40. Okay, Nick says, just wondering if you could discuss at a higher level some pros and cons of investment method structures, particularly for your kids. I'm a relatively new dad. My son just turned one. And in the meantime... NDQ, the beta shares NASDAQ ETF, is up about 50% since this time last year while I've been sitting on my hands. Would appreciate your views as to, as to some general non-advice pros and cons of different methods to invest which can help strengthen the financial future for your kids and family. Wow, it's a big broad canvas, that one. Well, He's basically sort of saying, do we set up a... You know, a trust fund for the kids. Do we get well, he's into not specifically asking Comsec that. Minor? So obviously Comsec's got a little thing called Comsec Minor where you can have a fund for your underage kids that you control. My sort of broad position would be, you know, pay down your mortgage, um, maximise your super. Like, you know, you can set up 27 different accounts to pre-save for, you know, school fees in 20 years' time or whatever. 
but I think it can get a bit complicated and uh, just focus on you know paying off your mortgage maximizing your super and then I don't know you certainly should be putting the, the most you can into super because that's the best tax correct that's the best tax vehicle you're getting taxed at 15 percent uh, so put put as much as you can into super and um, and if you've got anything left over after paying off your mortgage uh, take a long-term view yeah um, but if you've got a one-year-old I don't reckon you're paying off your mortgage. Yeah. I mean, you know. I mean, the one that hits you always is the old private school fees, after-tax dollars. So if you can put a bit away, I reckon the private schools should offer, you know, pay up front arrangements. You know, you get a discount if you pay up front because a lot of people spend everything they earn and they get to the they get to the private school fees phase and that's the last holiday they take for 10 years because they've totally underestimated the actual cost of bringing up kids. Okay, Trevor says, I particularly appreciate the recent discussions on climate change and renewables. I think James absolutely hit the nail on the head last week that cost of living pressures are reducing the perceived immediacy of climate change, or at least shifting our focus away from it. So my question is, how well do you believe the Australian global financial market is actually pricing in climate risk? Economically, we're told a dollar in the future is worth less than a dollar today. Is it reasonable to underspend on climate risk mitigation, even knowing it will cost us far more in the future? Well, uh, I think you've just got to spend up big now, and this is a massive risk we've got to manage. It's not so much, uh, yeah. So th- there's two sides of this coin. There's what you've got to spend to mitigate, or what are you got to spend to reduce emissions, which is enormous. Uh, but I think the bigger cost is going to be the effect of the extreme weather. Correct. Which is so. So apparently, I, I read something yesterday that the global temperature has already reached 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial, which was the Paris thing, the target that we're trying to keep the global warming to. Uh, that was back in 2015. Um, so we've got we're there now with 1.5, and um, we're clearly going to uh, whiz past 1.5, heading towards two, and then beyond two, and. All the discussions I've had with scientists on this matter suggest that anything cl- approaching two degrees above pre-industrial age and beyond is catastrophic. It's going to and, be terrible. And I would say that we're already, in terms of the pricing, let's have a look at your insurance premiums. I think that that is a, a really clear area where the, the, the changing climate, the, the, the greater catastrophes and storms and fires and floods is being priced by the insurance industry and we're seeing it with yeah, every right, the problem, renewal notice we get. The problem for the government is, and therefore taxpayers, is that a whole lot of people are becoming uninsurable. Mm. Everyone living on, living on a floodplain in this country is basically becoming uninsurable. So yeah, they're going to have to... And the government of last resort insurer is coming that's in. That's right. So that's gonna, there's going to be a lot of cost on the government yeah. at some point yeah. uh, when they go under. Yeah, well, Victoria's done the old fire services levy, which is a pendant to your rates notice, and that's a, a way they're funding um, some of right. the costs of, you know, the big fires and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, and also, I mean, in terms of how well the market is pricing, obviously you've got the... Accus, the Australian Carbon Credit Units, and that's currently at thirty-seven dollars, and that's the whole sort of tradable unit of carbon and the right to to pollute. And then you've got things like uh, the, the market cap of coal miners. I often find the big coal miners often trade at a big discount um, to their cash flows, just like big tobacco trades at a big discount because a lot of people won't invest in it. But um, yeah, overall, do you think that that Climate risk is being appropriately priced globally by the global markets. No, I, I mean, don't. No, I think no. it's... Uh, Jane, um, uh, Jane says, I've noticed many stocks go out on spectacular runs due to speculation of a potential takeover or capital raising. This is uh, happening usually a day or two before the company has made an ASX announcement, Appen being a crazy example last week. Who is likely leaking this confidential information and why are there no consequences for these leaks? I'm sick of being the last to know. It's not fair. <laughs> well, Jane. Look, I feel the same way, Jane. <laughs> well, look, I mean, you can always come up with a big percentage number, Jane, when something has fallen a long way. So, yes, Appen shares did jump 30% from $0.87 cents to $1.11 last week with the speculation or the, the leak of the takeover bid by NASDAQ-listed InnoData which then got pulled a week later and the stock is now back at 67 cents. 
But I just point out, Jane, that Appen shares were at $35 in July 2020. So it has crashed, you know, more than 90%. Um, and so it's not like billions of dollars no, but, were but, created. But, it was but, a, but she's got a point about leaks, right? Things things are getting leaked all the time. No, What's no, going I would, on? I would look, look, CSR leaked, but overall the market is much better now with continuous disclosure. You, usually a stock will get suspended and then a takeover will get announced at a 40% premium. Yeah, but and somebody, picks up, all. somebody picks up the phone to Street Talk. Well, I agree you know. with you that Street Talk is And why don't they the pick AFR up the phone is, to me? That's well, what I want to yes, know. I know. We're all in the scoops market and Street Talk – the bigger problem with Street Talk is they get – capital raising details before the stock has been suspended or before the detail has been announced to the ASX. And you know the best example I ever heard of, of how Street Talk has become a, a de facto announcements platform? I remember having a, a coffee with Mark Birrell, who uh, was then the chair of the Port of Melbourne, and he's on the board of Transurb and a few others, and he was the, he was the chairman of Citywide and I was the councillor responsible for Citywide of City of Melbourne, and he said to me, yeah, look, the government's selling off um, uh, Port of Melbourne. And look, we basically announced it in Street Talk today. So the Street Talk had an item saying Morgan Stanley's been appointed and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And yeah, so you have the chairman of the Port of Melbourne telling me that we've announced the $10 million privatisation in Street Talk because the government never put out a press release saying we've hired Morgan Stanley to, to run an auction to sell but the Port of Melbourne for $10 million. It's dodgy. That is an outrage. It is outrageous. I agree. I mean, but it's become an acceptable way I mean, of Street informing Talk, the market. Street Talk is in the Financial Review, which is a subscription publication. Yes. It's not even available to everyone to read. Correct. You've got to be a subscriber. Correct. I mean, heavens above. Yeah, so there should be what a public, They should announce it in, in the New Daily, which is free. Well. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, your turn. Now, Penny wants to know, I would like to know what tax CEOs and senior managers of companies do pay. I'm not suggesting they're paying less than the law allows. I'm not asking for the tax of a particular CEO uh, to be disclosed, but she has difficulty believing that CEOs on one, two, three, five million pay the same tax in the proportion as waged employees earn. Would you please detail some of the tax laws that CEOs use and what benefits they provide? Now... I would just like to say, Penny, that they pay the same as everybody else um, and they will use um, fully franked dividends, negative gearing, maxing out your super, capital gains tax discounts. They will use all those same things that anyone else will use. And the far bigger scandal is not what CEOs are taxed. The far bigger scandal is what billionaires are taxed on the earnings from their assets. That is the far bigger scandal. And I do want to make a reference to my one of my all-time favourite ASX announcements. When AMP sacked Paul Batchelor in 21 years ago and they were having disagreements about his payout and the chairman put out an ASX announcement saying, quote, AMP has today paid former CEO Paul Batchelor $2.1 million as compensation for his termination in September 2002. Chairman Peter Wilcox said AMP had delivered the former CEO a cheque for $1.4 million which is net of 0.7 million of tax. And he went on to say, if you want any more, see you in court. But that was the only time I'd ever seen an ASX announcement which detailed a very large payment to the CEO, but he didn't get 2.1 million because 700,000 went straight to Canberra in straight out tax. And that is a typical example of how CEOs pay a lot of tax just like everyone else does. What do you reckon, Alan? Oh, I reckon that's interesting. Yeah, you go. there you go. You don't often see that. Uh, Chris says there's been recent discussion around super funds with significant stakes in companies potentially seeking board representation. The case for it, which I'm sympathetic to, is that given super funds' long-term investment views, it would be ultimately beneficial to shareholders. What is your view on this? Look, it's a very Stephen. interesting question. So. I'm generally supportive of anyone who owns more than 10% of a public company. If they would like a board seat, that it should not be unreasonably withheld because, you know, you, you might have 10 directors and so if you own 10%, that's generally the level when you're allowed to have a voice in the room. And I find it puzzling why our big super funds don't appoint more directors. Like Aussie Super, in my view, with their $300 billion, they should have a stable of 30 full-time professional directors who they back, who they rely on, who they vouch for their credibility and honesty, and they slot them onto various boards here, there and everywhere. 
but they don't do that. They, they never associate themselves with any directors. They never seek a board seat for themselves. They're just passive. And I reckon it's time that these big industry funds actually stepped up and took responsibility for the calibre or lack of calibre inside the boardrooms of Australian public companies. Good point, Stephen. Excellent. Now, Phil says, regarding property supply, I assume at some point in history it was primarily governments that developed and issued land for building on. Now it seems to be the case that it is only private developers who develop land and effectively control supply. Only developing land when it's economically attractive to do so, even if they point the finger at government approvals, etc. Do you agree this has shifted control of housing away from the government and what are the pros and cons over the long term? Yes, I agree. That's what's happened. Governments have vacated the field. Yes, but um, I would argue that the much bigger problem is the zoning on land and the constraints on development rather than governments sitting on land. And at City of Manningham, we usually get $6 million a year from developers and for the last three years, it's, it's pretty much halved to $3 million a year in the subdivision tax. And that's because they're sitting on permits and not developing the permits that we've given them. So the issue is developers, you know... Uh, yeah, but the councils, I'm sure it isn't Manningham, but councils often make it really hard for developers to do it. And also developers, it's true, um, are motivated by profit, of course. That's right. So, uh, but there should be some housing at least that is not motivated by profit and is just built because it needs to be built. I totally agree with we need much more government-owned housing. Correct. And That's what they I'm should, saying. they should grab land, empty land, and, and turn it into housing. We yeah. need much more of that. Jared says there needs to be an inquiry into McDonald's and Hungry Jack's because their price increases don't match inflation. <laughs> The beloved soft serve ice cream cone has been 80 cents for a few years, if not longer, and it's now a dollar, up 25%. Unbelievable. Jared's outraged. Uh, That's our biggest concern. I mean, we've got a question also about soaring insurance premiums, and I think that is a massive issue. Uh, driving yeah, but what about what about serving soaring soft serve ice cream prices? Look, I mean, I'm, I thought it was more outrageous when Seven Eleven increased their minimum coffee from one dollar to two dollars. And the other, I used to always buy that's a hundred percent. I used to always buy four liters of milk from Seven Eleven for five dollars when I was justifying my coffee addiction purchase. So I always had to buy something else. And the other day I went in and it was seven dollars fifty now for that uh, two for the price of. That's 50% inflation on milk at 7-Eleven. So, look, it's just across the board, out of control. And if you can get anything for a dollar anywhere, Jared, including a soft serve, you're doing extremely well. Now, and also, I would say that if the thing, if these soft serves have been sitting on 80 cents for years and have just gone leader. up to a dollar, they're come a on. They're a loss leader to get you through the door. So, uh, now, Andrew... It's got a, it's having a whinge about the gender pay gap, saying that the data is simplistic and flawed and he's getting stuck into James, who's not here to defend himself, because James made the point that it's mainly men who are complaining about the gender data and I'm actually going to defend James. A- including Andrew. Including Andrew, who <laughs> we've just given... Uh, uh, let him ventilate his uh, his whinge about the data being flawed and simplistic. What I really like about this mass disclosure of data is companies are encouraged to explain why their data might show something. So that that is bringing people out from under the cover. So Gina Reinhardt the other day is saying, well, if you didn't include all our truck drivers, the differential would be 10%, not 20%, because we've hired all these female truck drivers who are not very well paid relative to all the mine workers. Why stuff. not? Did she explain why well, not? No, but she was just embarrassed by the 20% gender gap as a rich woman, and she was giving context and explaining why, and trumpeting the fact no, but that she's hired did, but all these female truck drivers, which is good. But, but why haven't? Why aren't they getting paid the same as the bloke truck drivers? No, no, no. Truck they drivers. are. The truck drivers are all getting the same. But it, the, the gender pay data looks at the you know the average or the median pay you know across the whole company. So across the whole of Qantas, the difference is 37%, right? And that was one of the biggest of all public companies. Why? Because you've got male pilots and female cabin staff. So. But Qantas has had to explain that. So at Coles and Woolies, the difference is only like 3 4 5% because you haven't got those industry structures and features. But it's very healthy to have this debate, so Andrew should stop whinging. <laughs> I'm looking forward to AGM questions about this. I'm, every company that has an AGM coming up, I'm going to hit them with their, what did you think of the data? What are you doing to respond to it? Is it okay to put this out there? And you know, what an interesting point of discussion at the AGM this is. 
Uh, okay, we've got time for a couple more questions. So let's have a look. What uh, we've got. Keelan says, my question is how Australia can better take responsibility for some of its export emissions. Obviously, there's a lot of dis- focus on reducing our domestic emissions, but not much is discussed on the impact of our fossil fuel exports. Yes, well, this is the great sort of hypocrisy and hidden element of Australia is we are making hundreds of billions of dollars exporting coal and iron ore and LNG, etc. cetera. Um, and we've never taxing that, you know, putting on a sort of a Export. carbon border adjustment mechanism like the Europeans have. Um, no, that's fine. That, but that's on imports, not on exports. Yeah, I know. So, what that's, so the point they're making is that we're not pricing here the fact that we're making hundreds of billions of dollars a year exporting carbon bombs. LNG, coal, iron ore, um, and I would say that we probably should, but no politician will do that no because one, it, would, no it, would, that. it would hurt us. So, but look, good, good point. Now, Edward, another poor old James is copying it here. Edward is tackling James for his defence of the superannuation cost structures, and particularly James has commented that for every hundred dollars in revenue, only two dollars sixty is profit. And 70 cents in the dollar is going to suppliers. And Edward just just doesn't sort of believe that. He just thinks that the, you know, how can suppliers, because he looks at the story of the farmers, farmers who are selling, you know. And I think that's an interesting question. And the answer probably is that the likes of the big global suppliers, like the Cokes, the Unilevers, the Procter & Gamble's, they're the ones who are getting the 70 to 80 percent of the cost because they're delivering a finished product that can just be put into the supermarket at scale and rolled out. Whereas anyone dealing in fresh food, farm gate to supply, massive logistics, perishable goods, there is a lot more cost in that. And I think the best example I ever heard was I was talking to the manager at Westfield Doncaster, and he was saying that that the average Coles and Woolies at Westfield pays two to three percent of turnover in rent, whereas at the food court, they are taking 40% of turnover in rent, and that's how they get to the average of 20% rent at a shopping centre. At a Westfield, Westfield Doncaster, they take 20%, but the range is 2% off Coles and Woolies and 40% off your, your fast food well, no, these, takeaway. No, one of these food courts are expanding. Yeah, well, well, that's right, because they're the highest margin yeah, um, yeah. thing for the supermarket, whereas Coles and Woolies are in there as the loss leader to get the people through the door, so they've got to have a big feed at the end of their shop. All right, Alan. One more. Jill says, interesting commentary on the nuclear issue. The cost is a major issue, but also the inability for nuclear to act as a flexible backup for intermittent renewables, solar and wind, whereas batteries, natural gas, with carbon capture, hydrogen can support these option, operations. I understand some of the pessimism on energy transition debate, uh, but take heart that there is a lot of momentum building globally for massive, with massive amounts of funding starting to be mobilised for the transition. And China is by far away the largest renewable energy producer and is growing rapidly. Uh, that is true. In fact, I've, uh, Jill, I've got a column in the New Daily this morning talking about the... Um, the coalition's nuclear policy and the extent to which it is a policy as opposed to just saying the word nuclear over and over <laughs> um, is that they what they want is a capacity mechanism or capacity market where people bid uh, to supply reliable capacity into the future and other a lot of other countries have a capacity market like that and nuclear is able to bid into it, even though you can't turn it on and off, because one of the ways to provide reliable capacity is to have something that just goes all the time. And the, to the extent that you need something that – we're going to need something in a net zero world, we're going to need something that goes all the time as opposed to is, um, fluctuating like solar and wind. Uh, nuclear is obviously the answer. Um, but – uh, it is possible that Australia isn't going to have nuclear because it is simply too expensive and doesn't yeah. work in Australia. And our uh, capacity market, if we ever get one, will be supplied by gas, uh, probably, until the batteries are good enough and big enough. Because the, part, the problem at the moment is the lithium batteries only last four hours. Mm. So you can transfer power from daytime to nighttime. Um, the Snowy 2.0. If the, once the dams are full, that'll supply power for seven days, mm. which is good. That's sort of more like it. And there's a company 
there's a company, a Canadian company called Hydro Store that's working on compressed air in mines near Broken Hill. They're going to fill the mines with compressed air, uh, which would then act like a battery with the compressed air kind of being escaping and turning turbines. And that's another way of storing energy which would also last a long time. So there's lots of different solutions being worked on uh, that don't involve fossil fuels but are required for reliability. It's funny, we're having our budget uh, all day Saturday discussion on Saturday and there's a $1 million line item in there for something, I won't say where, but battery. So I'm being asked to spend a million dollars on a battery. There you go. This uh, coming budget. That'll be so a community. That'll be a community Manningham battery. Yeah, I'm thrilled that our car share scheme has now got 600 members, so we're getting cars off the road. But look, on Jill's point, I agree. We're, the world is still moving massively strongly on climate, as we must. As for uranium, I don't understand why the coalition is doing it. I agree with Alan that it should be uh, the ban on uranium should be lifted. There will never be a market solution for uranium power. Why is Dutton doing it? I think it's because Gina Reinhart is lobbying him and pushing for it. Why is Gina Reinhart putting, pushing it? I think she just wants to have the mining industry legitimised because the thing about uranium power is you have to dig up the uranium. It is a mining process. So I think all the fossil fuel dinosaurs are on uranium because it is still the mining industry. Whereas solar and renewables and wind, etc., has nothing to do with digging up the dirt and extracting. That's a very good point. I think you've answered something there, Stephen. Because why does Gina care about uranium otherwise? I mean, she's making a truckload out of iron ore. She's not in the uranium industry. She's going hell for leather, saying, "Come on, Dutz, let's uh, let's just go all in on uh, uranium." Does she, does she call him? Does she call him Dutz? Well, does she? He, he does seem to be her poodle. So. Um, Flying all over the country come for here, her Dutch. birthday and stuff. Hey, Dutch, says, Dutch get, get on the uranium train, mate. Dutch, he's come, very obedient. Come he's an to angry my party. Man, except for Virginia. He so just she, went to his, she went to her he party. She flew all the way to Perth just to speak at her party. He was on the ground for 40 minutes and flew all the way back. I mean, come on. He's very obedient. Angry Dutz. Anyway, we're done. Well, that was great. Thanks for listening, everyone, to today's episode of Money Cafe. I'll be back next week with, ja- uh, with James. Send in a question and we'll answer it together by email. And email us to themoneycafe at eurekareport.com.au. So I'm Alan Kohler, founder of Eureka Report, which is now owned by Intelligent Investor. And I'm Stephen May, and I'm just one of Alan's casual contributors at The Intelligent Investor, and we'll see you in a fortnight. <laughs> <laughs>